when I look at the daunting task of doing the 100-year history of film in Utah, uh, I would have to say I'm qualified from the standpoint of having produced, directed, written, edited, and shot a camera uh, for 56 years. And although some people will deride that and say, well, it's just documentaries and a lot of them about sports because there are elitists who feel like that doesn't qualify as a filmmaker, it certainly has piqued my interest in all forms of film. And uh, my wife and daughter are here to, tonight and they can attest to the fact that when I'm not doing something of worth, I'm sitting there watching a movie of worth <laughs> of all different types. I mean, I watch movies that you would not spend three minutes watching, but there's something about it. There's so well, it's all magic, isn't it? It's, uh, they don't move the images. It's uh, something in your brain called persistence of vision, where the optic nerve transmits the image that you're seeing uh, with your eyes to the brain, and but there's just a little split-second uh, pause, and that split-second pause is then filled in almost completely with another image if you run them in sequence. And so this still photograph or a still uh, digital capture appears to move. There's no movement, <laughs> but uh, to me that's the ultimate uh, magic show. That if the brain was just a little bit late, you just see still, 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 still. <laughs> but uh, I have to give it to God that he backed up those images and made them appear to move. So uh, then I translate that into, how am I going to do 100 years of uh, film in Utah? Uh, because I looked it up, and there have been over 800 films uh, made in, in, U in U primarily in Utah. A lot of other ones have a shot here or there. But 800 plus have the whole thing. And then, uh, so there's 100 directors plus, because some of the films had two directors. And there's 2,843 principal actors that have come to the state of Utah to make a movie. And primarily in the rural areas. Uh, in the last 10, 15 years, there's been more up north in the populated areas. But it all started down here, right where we live. And so uh, I couldn't cover all 800. <laughs> and so I just thought, I'm going to give a discussion about my favorite films, the things that stood out to me. And that's what all you should do anyway. After you leave here, you could say, you know, I didn't like anything he likes, but I'm going to go out and find what I like. But these are some of the ones that I like, and some interesting factoids that we can uh, all kind of get behind. So I'm going to start this off, and it's a bit of an experiment because I thought, how am I going to show the history of the movies if I don't show the movies? And I'm not a PowerPoint guy. I'm not going to sit here and click a button every time I want something to come up. So I just made a 50-minute movie. <laughs> out of the clips I want to show. And now the trick is for me to be able to narrate that 50 minutes with my thoughts on, on what you're seeing. So let's start uh, and see how we go. I want to make sure we have a balance between what you're hearing of the soundtrack and my voice. So we'll, we'll start out and see if we got it figured out here. So this came from the uh, Utah Film Commission with clips from the different movies that have been made in the state. And so I put a, together a list of the actors who had played in these particular films. And I'll narrate it by giving these names. Uh, Howard Hughes, Tom Hanks, Nicolas Cage, 
Johnny Depp, Wallace Beery, Henry Fonda, James Garner, Cary Grant, Don Knotts made a play, Carol Lombard, Mel Gibson, Sidney Poitier, Dean Jagger, Tex Ritter, Judy Garland, Glenn Ford, Ridley Scott, Paul Muni, Alfred Hitchcock, Mamie Van Doren, and Jimmy Stewart, Clark Gable, Ingrid Bergman, Tex Ritter, Paul Newman, and the ever favorite Chill Wills. Uh, some more here. Alan Ladd, Jamie Lee Curtis, Margaret O'Brien, Laura Dern, Claudette Colbert, uh, Jimmy Brown, the football player, Roseanne Arquette, Sam Rockwell, John Carradine, Robert Redford, Johnny Mac Brown, Gregory Peck, uh, Sabu the Elephant Boy was here, and Robert Redford, uh, Max Van Saito, the, Al the Anthony Boys, Anthony Quinn and Anthony Hopkins, Willie Nelson, Dolores Del Rio, Jack Nicholson, Susan Hayward, Kevin Costner, Tommy Lee Jones, Howard Hawks, Roddy McDowell, uh, Signori Weaver, Carol Baker, Jody Foster, Clint Eastwood, and there he is, Tom Cruise, let's not forget him, uh, Preston Foster, Noah Berry and Noah Berry Jr., Van Heflin. Those are just a few, just a handful of the actors who have come through. Here's Kevin Costner himself. And there's news that he's uh, thinking of building a studio out near the Arizona border. And as we get closer, you see the covered wagon coming up. That was the first film shot in the state of Utah. And that was in 1923. So that makes up the hundred years of the history. This is Con Air, where uh, Monument Valley and Thelma and Louise, and this is one of my all-time favorites, Robert Redford in Grizzly Adams. So we have had such, I, I mean, outside of the state of uh, California, we have the most activity. This is the covered wagon made by uh, James Cruz, the director. And James was uh, a Hollywood uh, noteworthy. And he came to Utah because he was hired because he was from Ogden, Utah. And he was born into a Mormon family. And this is supposed to be the wagon train coming west, the Mormon trek. And so, he was able, with his contacts, to put together over 200 covered wagons. And some of them were the original covered wagons brought here uh, from the east by the Mormon pioneers that families had kept. And uh, here's a humorous little thing covering most people's idea of what a Mormon is. And the, the great thing about uh, James Cruz is he knew where everything was. Here are the, the bison on Antelope Island. So he had a whole bison stampede. And uh, he was all into the accuracy. So they actually killed seven buffalo. <laughs> and uh, there, there was no uh, PETA people on, on set. Uh, so he... He was able to create this accuracy and have the, you know, the Indians attack the covered wagons. And these, these covered wagons, they, they paid the people that owned the wagons $2 a day to come. And, and here, of course, the guy gets the girl at the end, like every Western, it set the stage for that. But these people would live in the covered wagons for $2 a day and it was a, a monumental hit. And he got a star on the Hollywood Boulevard for making that movie. So then, The Vanishing American came next, and it was a Zane Gray story. 
And he wanted to show the other side of the equation. So, you know, uh, the pioneers came, but what about the people who were already there? So it's a magnificent film about the whole history. And here's, here are the uh, Native Americans in their habitat. And you'll notice where this is shot. Who can guess where that is? And it's Monument Valley. They went out there, uh, the, the film crew, and got these shots of Monument Valley 30 years before John Ford and John Wayne claimed to have discovered Monument Valley. <laughs> so uh, we have hi historical record that, th that they didn't uh, discover it. And in this movie is all these great uh, scenarios. We're surrounded by this. Sometimes we don't uh, give it credit. But uh, there's a, a nice little bit here where the, the settlers kind of uh, indicate what they think of the Indians. They're his friends, but he's going to kill them anyway. And so this is the first time people have seen the, the Rainbow Arch and all these beautiful locations in the state of Utah. And they, they became uh, noted for these. And that's the Vanishing America. American, you ought to check that out. And then that opened the gateway. Tom Mix, who is the, the leading uh, cowboy heartthrob of the day, came to southern Utah. And these were the days of the silent films. And he did uh, the Riders of the Purple Sage and Deadwood Coach. And he was the strong silent type. I, I have to say he's not much of an actor. He just stands there and looks at people. <laughs> and well, it was silent movie, so he, he didn't need to act. And uh, look, at, look at that look. He's, that's a scary dude. So, but these, these, they were trying to replicate what, uh, what had been done for the covered wagon. And, uh, but he didn't quite get the girl here because he would look at her but he wouldn't uh, get any closer than that. <laughs> he was a he-man, I guess. And, uh, and so the, the die was cast for how these movies were going to be shot. And they were a dime a dozen. The scenery was better than the acting. And they all just kind of replicated the same plots over and over. But look at uh, the magnificent scenery all over uh, around uh, Cedar City and up in, on Cedar Mountain. And so uh, the word spread. You know, if you don't have the goods with your actors, why don't you just go to Southern Utah and at least it'll look good. <laughs> and then the, uh, another uh, actor who became much more famous than Tom Mix was uh, Gary Cooper. And Gary Cooper, he was not a fighting man. He was cast always as the Lothario, always, uh, you know, getting out of the way of the fight, and, but then looking across the street and seeing a, a pretty girl. And so the rest of the movie is he's just making eyes at this girl. <laughs> and uh, you can see uh, how damaged the film is. Most of the Westerns from that era in the 20s uh, no longer exist. And, and this one is preserved, but it, the quality is not great. And this is up on, uh, uh, up in, uh, Cedar yeah, Cedar Breaks. Here's a fake shot of Carrie, uh, or <laughs> Gary. <laughs> yeah, by uh, Gary used the editing to make it look like he actually could use a lasso. And, uh, but then the rest of it is just him looking at the girl. And <laughs> did you see him flutter his eye, eyelids? And so uh, people ate this stuff up, and it, they, it wasn't that expensive. And these brothers, uh, Gonway and uh, Chauncey uh, Perry, saw the advantage of being able to bring film companies into the uh, Cedar City area. 
they had the concession for transportation in uh, the uh, Zion National Park. And so they got in on the ground floor. They invited uh, Warren G. Harding, the president, with his cabinet members, Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover, and to come and look it over. Then they took a bunch of photographs and went to Hollywood and said, we have these wagons, these stage coaches, the scenery. We have the, the horses. We have the cowboys. We have the backgrounds. Uh, all the things that you would need. And this is in Zion National Park. Today, it's very difficult to get a permit to film in Zion's. Back then, these guys would just go in there. One of them was a guy named uh, Raoul Walsh. He had played John Wilkes Booth in the movie uh, The Birth of a Nation. And he found this place, Grafton. And he thought, what can I add to this stereotype? What I'll do is shoot location sound. And right at the beginning of the talkies. And this was in old Arizona. This is Warren Baxter, who is uh, a white guy playing a Mexican. And uh, this is some of the, uh, the sounds that they captured live in Oops. He was so proud of his location sound <laughs> that he had to have these dudes singing this song. And so uh, Warren Baxter was playing the Cisco Kid. And look at this scenery of Cedar Breaks. And he was a desperado. <laughs> he was a robber, but then he gave her a, a gold coin. <laughs> he was like Robin Hood, I guess. And then the real girlfriend is a senorita who uh, was a prostitute, you know very obviously portrayed as such. So you have a desperado and a prostitute as your stars of the movie, which probably wouldn't happen today. Check, a, check her out. And uh, this is so corny looking, but he, he won an Academy Award. He won the Oscar for the best actor of the year. I don't know where everybody else was, but uh, Look at, again, just the scenery, you know? And all of these people in Hollywood are saying, oh, I can't wait to get there to make a movie with that as the background. Look at the church in Grafton. Do you recognize that? And uh, that would be used as a set over and over and over and people would build on it. And, and uh, all the way through, it was uh, Warren Baxter hamming it up. That's the way he really looked. He was a white guy. And uh, then uh, the director, Raoul Walsh, let me stop that. He, uh, he was so th enthusiastic. He brought all this sound equipment, which was really tough to, to manage, to uh, Grafton. And he was driving from the set back to where they were staying and a deer, a deer jumped out in front of his uh, automobile and went right through the windshield and put out his eye. So he was a very d famous director the rest of his life and with the eye patch. And somebody said, oh, you must have been devastated when that happened. He said, well, no, this is my image now with the eye patch. I, I wouldn't want it any other way. And that's Raul. So here are the, the lineup under the, the Tonto Rim, the Vanishing Pioneer. Uh, there, most of these are Zane Gray. Gary Cooper came back in Arizona ba Bound. And William Boyd, who became Hoplon Cassidy in the Night Flyer. 
the great divide. And uh, all of these posters played up the fact that you were gonna see pro approximately the same uh, storyline. And nobody cared, as long as somebody got shot. <laughs> That was Johnny Mac Brown's big moment there. So the, the Perry brothers were really onto a hot thing because now the big budget films were coming. Look at the, uh, the play up of this particular story. This was a uh, eight, oh no, a $3.8 million budget of a film supposedly taking place in China but China was just outside Cedar City, as it turns out. <laughs> and this is uh, Pearl S. Buck's uh, The Good Earth, yeah. And Paul Muni played Wang the Farmer, and Louise Rayner played Olan, his wife. Well, she was a white lady, and Paul Muni was definitely a white guy who were married in the film there's, there's what Paul Muni really looks like. I don't know how you could buy him as uh, the farmer, but there you go. And there was this weird thing where they cast Paul Muni because he was a huge box office draw. And then they, uh, they, they got criticized for that. Why didn't you hire a Chinese actor to play that part? And so they said, well, he's already hired, he signed a contract. And then they said, well, why don't you hire a uh, Chinese woman to be his wife? And they, they had a ruling back in those days that you could not portray misogyny on the screen. So even though she was playing a Chinese woman, she was white and he was a white guy playing a Chinese man, and, and they were thought to, they have to be either both white or both Chinese. And so that's why that decision was made. Oh my goodness, you think that would cause a stir today? <laughs> but they, uh, if you've watched the film, was that? Oh, okay, yeah. I keep letting it creep up. Some of these uh, trailers really pump the music up. It's still hot. Dang it. There we go. And so Paul Muni, he found out through the producers that there was going to be a swarm of uh, grasshoppers coming to Cedar City. And they found the, the, the field where that was gonna happen. And then they brought in 18,000 pounds of uh, grasshoppers from California. And they actually created this uh, swarm of locusts they're supposed to be. But if you look closely, they're grasshoppers. I guess that didn't matter. And uh, this is a pretty sensational scene for a movie being shot in a little, uh, little town in southern Utah. And this got tremendous publicity. But it also drew so many of uh, the cast and crew that the Perry brothers knew that it couldn't be sustained in Cedar City. So after this was over and it was a big success, they had it all set in Kanab at the Perry Brothers uh, Lodge. You think they weren't good businessmen? They'd already built the place where people could come stay. And it was all furnished. So that was one of the problems before people had to live in tents when they came to make movies. But they had cottages and that really jump-started what became known as Little Hollywood because they had so many films coming here that they had Western sets. They built the uh, Western streets. They 
they had all of the uh, crew de ma to make a film already sitting there. And so this is a film with John Wayne and look at the cast. They're all staying at the Perry Lodge. And so it was John Wayne and Gabby Hayes passed through and Charlton Heston and Forrest Tucker. I don't know who the girl was. Howard Duff, the uh, noir mystery guy. Uh, Audie Murphy, who was a, a Medal of Honor winner in World War II and made 12 movies in Southern Utah. Okay, C could, could you come up and, because I'm, I'm having trouble. Just whenever you hear it start to, oh. Burl Ives, the folk singer, passed through. Dale Evans without Roy Rogers. He was lost somewhere. And uh, Mrs. Robinson, Anne Bancroft, and Mrs. Frank Sinatra, Ava Gardner, uh, and uh, Rita Marino also made a movie at that time. And May, uh, Mamie Van Doren, they're all staying at the lodge, the Perry brothers. And the strangest one was uh, Sabu the Elephant Boy. Really? How does that fit in? Well, the Perry brothers found the uh, coral pink sands over there by uh, Colorado City, and they made this movie Arabian Nights. Now, they also had, this is Pariah Canyon, and they had all of these things that turned it into uh, to the... Uh, Why can't I get that to work? You want the volume back up? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, Sabu, they were grooming him to be a big, a big star, a little bit lower. So he could ride a horse and he could go over the pink uh, coral sand dunes and with a cast of thousands, because the Perry brothers could get a cast of thousands. They could get a, uh, hundreds of horses. And uh, everybody was really happy with the way things went. But Sabu, let me stop it. Yeah, but Sabu didn't come out of it uh, as a star. You know, for some reason, people rejected the notion of him being the leading man. So even though he had been the leading man in the jungle pictures, it didn't work on the sands. And uh, I was happy when I came across this. Again, it's a personal thing, because my favorite singer-songwriter is a guy named John Prine. And one of the songs I love is called Sabu uh, uh, Travels to the Twin Cities Alone. And it's dealing with this very thing. Sabu didn't catch on. The movie didn't catch on. So what if the producers sent him to Minneapolis, St. Paul to have to promote the movie? And he's the elephant boy. How's he gonna survive there? So as soon as I saw this film, I thought of John Prine. And so I included a little bit of that song. Well, it's not the whole song, it's only part of it. The movie wasn't really doing so hot. <laughs> Set the new producer to the old big shot. It's dying on the edge of the great midwinds. Set the mask to the old forever in the day. Hey, look, my head comes the up in the cold. Bundled all up in his cold room. Headed down south to Illinois from the jungle to the St. Paul. His manager sat in the office alone, staring at the numbers on the telephone, wondering how a man could send a child acting to visit in the land of the windshield family. Hey, look, my, here comes the elephant boy. 
Bunny all up in the school room In the down south of Illinois From the jungles of East St. Paul From the jungles of East St. Paul From the jungles of East St. Paul <laughs> So it was back to the Westerns. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be Arabia, so now we'll start making uh, all right, very similar cowboy dramas. This one is called uh, The Pony Express. And uh, again, the Perry brothers had it all worked out. Every, see, now it needs to be up again. They're talking. I'll try and talk louder. How's that? Because going up and down is not working. Stood two immortal figures of the West. Buffalo Bill Coney, played by the screen's newest star, Charlton Heston. And Wild Bill Hickok, played by Rugged Forrest Tucker. There was also uh, a little bit of uh, sexual tension added into them, which hadn't been there before. Ladies in the bathtub. But uh, it all boiled down to the shoot 'em ups and all of the, this, these props and stocks that the Perry brothers were, were able to provide. And this is, this is a case of uh, they needed this super Arabian horse and the Perry brothers came up with it. And then they came up with 400 other uh, horses to follow the uh, Arabian. You couldn't find that anywhere else. And that's why, and the Perry brothers were making money hand over fist because of this. People were staying at their lodge, eating in the restaurant that they owned, and, and the, uh, f the film companies were spending a ton of money on location. And again, the star was the scenery. You couldn't beat it anywhere. This particular one uh, made even better use of the, the horsepower that they could bring to it because they, they were able to uh, have a, a herd of 2,000. There's Anthony Quinn playing a Mexican. And, uh, and then look, look at these, uh, these herds that they were able to put together. It boggles my mind to think of being able to uh, set the cameras up and to capture all of that. And then here's one of the sets that, that they had in Kanab. They had it all going. And then um, Ava Gardner happened to be in this one. And uh, I re remember I said that uh, she was married to, to Frank Sinatra. And so she told her husband, you got to come make one of your movies here. This is the greatest place in America to make a cowboy movie, or a Western of any type. <laughs> so he showed up, and uh, he, who had to come with him? The Rat Pack had to come with him. <laughs> and there they are. <laughs> and uh, look at them. They're, they're so proud of themselves. They made this movie uh, called Sergeants Three as a remake of a movie called Gunga Din which uh, was written by Rudyard Kipling, but Cary Grant and his buddies there, Douglas Furbanks Jr., one of them, they made a mockery of, of the novel Gung Gunga Din. And so Frank and the Rat Pack decided, hey, let's just have some fun with this. Plus, they looked at it as a vacation. They get out of where they're from. There's plenty of women. That's not Ava Gardner, though. And uh, they just were having a ball. In fact, 
there was a, a club that was set up uh, called the Black Cat. And no local in Kanab was allowed in the Black Cat because they broke all the liquor rules there and it was only for the Rat Pack and their buddies. But everybody knew it was there. Look at this scene from Sergeant's Three and you can see what a mockery. All they're doing is like a skit from the Carol Burnett show. <laughs> So the Rat Pack had a great time, but it really upset a lot of people in Kanab. And the Perry brothers could see that things were changing. Their sets were becoming decrepit, and they were starting to lose a battle with the state of Utah because of the salacious nature of the films they were bringing in. And, and so there was a big push from the state capital that we can't let the Perrys have a monopoly here. And so the transition was made to Monument Valley. And here was where the epic quality of the Utah locations came to the front. Because everybody knows what these locations are. And you remember the, the Native Americans had claimed it for their own in 1923. But John Wayne and John Ford, the director, kind of said they found it and uh, nobody countered them. So, but they were really uh, tremendous assets to the film business in Utah. Now, some people said that you, it, that uh, Monument Valley was in Arizona instead of Utah. And it's true that portion of Monument Valley goes into Arizona, but the main portion is in Utah, and that's where all the resources were. That's where the lodging and, the, and all of the things that you needed to make a movie. So we proudly claim Monument Valley as our own as it applies to the movies. And there's uh, John Ford, the original. And look at these shots that he got. Never to be seen before, and many times to be seen after, because it's the language of film. You see something like that, and you fill in all the gaps. This is in the West. The, these are the uh, scenes that you would see with the with Western population. And so that is the backdrop to these stories. So uh, Ford and, and Wayne made uh, many movies. And in this case, the DP told John, uh, John Ford that it was too dark to film. But Ford said, film anyway because maybe we'll get something. And this is what they got. Lightning strikes coming out of the sky. And this is not computer graphics. This is actual lighting, lightning. And there was enough light to, to cover that scene in a way that could not be done otherwise. And everything had to be done in, cam in camera back in those days. Listen to John Ford here. Tech one, more, more, more than one tech boy. Sure. <laughs> Mr. Ford, you made a picture called Three Batman, mm -hmm. which is a large scale western. You had a quite elaborate land rush in it. Mm -hmm. How did you shoot that? With a camera. <laughs> <laughs> what, what particular element about the western appealed to you from the beginning? Hell would no. <laughs> well, would you agree that the point of uh, Fort Apache? Was that the uh, tradition, the tradition of the army was more important than one individual? Cut. 
<laughs> so John Ford was a garrulous old guy, but he was a genius visualization director. And he and John Wayne put this all together legendary. So Indiana Jones went to Monument Valley. And through the years, uh, Back to the Future, Easy Rider, Electroglide and Blue, which is a great movie if you haven't seen it, that, that features Monument Valley. 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, Thelma and Louise, sailing into the Grand Canyon, or who knows where it was. They, yeah, well, they, and this is uh, Buster Scruggs, the ballad of Buster Scruggs by the Coen brothers. And this is the road that uh, Forrest Gump ran along so all of these things, as I say, it's the language of film. You see it and you know you've uh, skipped right past a lot of the exposition that you would need to do. And this is one of my favorite Monument Valley films, which many people have never heard of. It's called uh, Paris, Texas. It's an art film starring uh, Harry Dean Stanton and he exemplifies kind of what I think of in, you know, if you don't think of John Wayne, you think of some guy completely lost and out of his element. And so the, just the feeling it gives you, the starkness of this whole thing. And also I like the movie because he's trying to get to Paris, Texas, but he never gets there. But that's the name of the movie. So I, I kind of like quirky things like that. So there, Harry Dean headed into the valley. And John Wayne was headed away from the valley because he had to go other places and prove he could make different kinds of film. Like The Conqueror in Snow Canyon. And everybody uh, knows this disaster. John Wayne is Genghis Khan. Ripping the blouse off Susan Hayward. Okay, can you turn that up? Sure. He took what he wanted when he wanted it. Poor guy beats his fire with ice, matches his fury with flame. Your angel will kindle in the lodge. <laughs> For that day dawn, the vultures will beat it on your heart. He's got the same accent as when he's a cowboy. <laughs> So our British friend didn't do his homework completely because subsequent analysis has shown that the number of cancer patients coming out of Snow Canyon is approximately the same with any like population. And plus the fact it's not taken into consideration that uh, John Wayne smoked four packs of cigarettes a day for his whole adult life. That might have had something to do with it too, you think? But he shouldn't have taken the role, yeah. <laughs> but you know, he made so many great movies. You can't, you can't hold that against him, can you? What, 
Although that was a stinker, I mean, in terms of a bomb. So uh, with his, uh, so you have Snow Canyon, and now as Lake Powell was rising, it created a whole new location for movies. Literally, the waters of Lake Powell were rising while they were shooting the greatest story ever told. And through the years, people have flocked to that. Uh, John Carter of Mars was shot there. There was a scene at the end of uh, the movie uh, Gravity uh, where Susan, or, uh, What's her name, Bullock? Sandra. Sandra. She comes up out of the water when she lands on the earth, and that's uh, Lake Powell. Look at all the stars in this movie. Take that, the chosen. <laughs> and look at the backgrounds. Unbelievable. They're not made out of plaster of Paris either. So now, all these different places to shoot in Utah. Robert Redford took advantage of them and enjoyed his experiences so much in Jeremiah Johnson that he bought a place up in what became Sundance. And then he and Paul Newman got together for one of the classic films of all time. And where did they go to shoot it? Well, a little place called Grafton for a portion of it. So nothing changed that much from the early 20s. Uh, here's Grafton. Here's the Palm Newman. Uh, what's her name? Catherine. Yeah, Catherine Ross. And if you read uh, Paul Newman's biography, you'll find out that he hated the scene with the bicycle with the raindrops falling on my head. He thought that was the most ludicrous thing he had ever heard of. <laughs> that that would take place in a Western movie. And he never came back to Utah to do a film after that. I don't know if there was a connection there or not. And there it is, the classic. And there's Grafton in the background. And then Robert Redford did come back for The Electric Horseman. That's a, a movie worth watching because it's in uh, Snow Canyon. And you see a whole chase scene on horses through St. George, if you've never seen that. Now here's Jodie Foster, a young girl in uh, Ten Little Indians, and Jodie Foster growing up in uh, Maverick. So there's generations. There's Julie Newmar, and she was supposed to swim, and they hated the look of the color of the water, so they had to go to the Panguitch egg uh, fish hatchery to get shots of her swimming in the nude. There's Rock Hudson as a Native American, and Sidney Poitier looking great against the rock, and Clint Eastwood and the outlaw Josie Wells. These people uh, loved coming. Now, these two films, The Shooting and Ride the Whirlwind, look at this guy. Jack Nicholson was a young actor and he couldn't get recognized. He, he was in low budget crappy movies. And uh, listen to his voice. He was, he was going to school and becoming the actor he would become. But he shot these, he shot these two movies at the same time. There, there's a... Uh, 
That's Jack Nichols. So he made these two movies simultaneously for 150,000 for both of them. And somebody started to notice. And then here we come back to the Rat Pack again. I had to put this in here. Spare me. Spare me the Rat Pack. <laughs> oh, a little uh, break here. And then uh, here's some of the movies we saw at the beginning. But this is what the state of Utah gives us now. The Bonneville Salt Flats. Uh, Goblin State Park or for uh, Galaxy Quest. Look at the hoodoos there. I mean, it's endless. Just when you think you've seen everything you can in the state of Utah, something else comes up, like the Capitol, like uh, Alta for the Grinch who stole Christmas. Uh, it's endless. And this was Con Air. This is one of my wife's favorite movies, so I had to include this. And all the convicts fix are being flown over what? Monument Valley. And then, of course, this is uh, a combination of about four different places, but it ends up going in the ditch anyway. And then here's Rob, uh, Kevin Costner, who supposedly is going to build this magnificent film studio. Let's hope. And then back to the Bonneville Salt Flats and... Uh, Will Smith, uh, what a place. Where, where else in the world would you find a location like that? And so different from all of the other locations in the state of Utah. But, and there's uh, the Arches National Monument for Indiana Jones. And I think coming up here is uh, Spellbound by Hitchcock because we get kind of jaded about the snow, but uh, plenty of movies. And then, of course, Kevin Bacon cutting a rug up there in uh, Payson. And what a scene. You couldn't duplicate that anywhere. And then here's Tommy showing off, hanging from a rock. Does all his own stunts, you know. And then here's... <laughs> Here's the famous shot. I just think of Paul Newman in, in his biography, so disgusted that he had to shoot this scene. And then this is monumental. This wasn't a fake. This was a guy up being a mountain man. And so now I just want to set this one up a little bit. Uh, I wanted to end off with a film that I particularly love. And it makes no sense that I love it. It's sort of a cheapy, uh, under the radar, it was a monumental failure when it was released. And it's taken uh, 40 years for it to get on the radar. And there's sort of a cult following of, for it now. It's called Carnival of Souls. Has anybody seen that here? One person, all right. <laughs> so I picked the right one. And this is just an example of, you don't, you don't have to watch Paul Newman ride the bicycle in Grafton to, to tell your friends. Pick a movie that nobody else cares about <laughs> and find a reason to fall in love with that movie and then uh, you got something. And this one I fell in love with because it is made by a guy named Herc Harvey. And Herc Harvey was a industrial filmmaker. That's a filmmaker who makes films about assembly line production of nuts and bolts. There's no art to it, but there's a professional approach to it. So, of course, in the back of his mind, he was, lived in Lawrence, Kansas, and he always wanted to make a feature film. But he was an industrial filmmaker. Nobody knew anything about him. He didn't have any friends in Hollywood. No way he was going to get money to make a film. 
but he was coming back from a convention of industrial filmmakers in LA and he drove back to, to uh, Lawrence and he drove past Saldair. And he saw this, this place out alongside the road and it was like Shangri-La to him. Like, what is that? And so when he got back to Lawrence, he had already made up a story to go along with that old deserted uh, dance pavilion. And he went back there and he got the guy who wrote his industrial films, he got his, the, uh, the guy who shot all his films, and he got a couple of actors, and he decided to make a movie about Salt Air. And uh, it was all based on that. He raised $33,000, he had 10 days of shooting, he shot in Lawrence, he shot in, in Salt Lake City, and he shot at Salt Air. And he came back and he made a movie and it went nowhere. <laughs> he wasn't even smart enough to copyright it. And so for years afterward, even when it became famous, he didn't control his own movie. People could steal it, whatever they wanted. But he never made another feature film. But to him, that was his holy grail. He had got to make a feature film. And so I'll, I'll kind of tell you what's going on as we go along here. So these kids are drag racing in Lawrence, Kansas. And uh, look at, uh, he learned to shoot the, uh, these car scenes with uh, auto safety films that he did for his company. And now he put it to use as a storytelling device where they're racing along. Look at the, the tracking shot. And it goes into the river and, and it sinks. And so then they, they immediately try and figure out how to save the girls that were in the car. They knew the three girls were in there. But this uh, title sequence is pretty good. I gotta hand it to him, that's not bad. And so he, uh, he found out he had to pay $12 to fix the bridge. So that was the, the first payment out of his 33,000. And then, so they, they combed the river, and they spent a lot of time there, they could find nothing. So obviously it's been uh, weeks, I mean days since they went in the river, so all three girls are dead, there's no chance that they could have survived. And then, mysteriously, a, a strange thing happened. All these people come. Look at this great shot of the shadows underneath of these people. That, that shows that he's made a film before, right? That's a match cutting of the shadows versus these guys coming up. And Herc Harvey, then one of the three girls climbs out of the river and she's alive with no explanation of why she should be alive. And uh, that starts this psychological, uh, the terror of psycho uh, psychology. How did this happen? Rather than some monster coming up and grabbing him, how did this happen? And filmmakers like George Romero, who did the original Night of the Living Dead, and Rob Zombie, who is a, a horror filmmaker himself, they learned about psychological terror from this movie, and they've, they've said that since. Uh, this is our, our hero, and uh, where did I put her name? She never went on to make another movie, so I don't know her name. But uh, so she, she decides she just has to uh, get away from the scene of this because it's so horrific. It's preying on her mind. And all of the music in here is organ music. And why was it organ music? because in Lawrence, Kansas, they make a famous kind of organ. And that was her job, to test the organs in this factory. So they have all these great shots, and the whole movie is organ music, just a single organ. So weird, so eerie. It gives, that gives you nightmares, the, the music track. So uh, you see a shot of her in the organ factory. 
So all of this is found uh, locations. They're not paying for anything. They knew the guy at the factory. Uh, they paid $12 for the bridge destruction. And, oh, what's her name? Sandra something. But, uh, so the whole soundtrack is established here. Isn't that a great shot? So Herc Harvey, who was a, a Scrabini filmmaker, he knew what a, a, a great uh, soundtrack could be. Could you turn that up? Good luck, Mary. Stop by and see us the next time you're in. Thank you, but I'm never coming back. Ooh. And that stiff kind of acting, you could say it's amateurish, but it works. It, it kind of get, makes you feel creepy. And so she, she decided she got a job in Salt Lake City. So she's driving to play the organ in Salt Lake City. Here she is entering Utah. And she starts having these visions that uh, she can't explain. Here she is driving along the shores of uh, Salt, uh, the Great Salt Lake. And she looks over and she sees this figure. And it's not there. She, uh, that was shot with mirrors that they reflected his image on the... And there's, the, there's Salt Air. So, uh, I don't know, I went out to Salt Air when it was all closed and it was, it was way creepy. So she keeps seeing this figure and uh, the organ keeps <laughs> setting your nerves on edge. It makes you want to run from the room, but it, it works. And so she has to figure out what's happening to her because she's not completely... Uh, so she goes to buy a dress, and this is ZCMI. And the way they were able to film there is they gave the sales lady 20 bucks and told her to take a break. And then they, they brought the camera on and shot this scene in ZCMI. And nobody caught him, nobody said anything. So now they don't know she's alive. They walk right past her. Everybody's ignoring her. She says, This is the psychological horror part, you know. If you watch the whole movie, you really get wound in the knot. And then every place she goes, you see this guy. And who was that guy? That was Herc Harvey, the director. <laughs> he, he couldn't uh, afford a specter, so he just put on some eye makeup and played the part. And here she is running down the streets of Salt Lake City. It's a hoot just to watch all the scenes you see in Salt Lake. And now she go, she's drawn to Salt Air because what's gonna happen there? She's gonna find the Carnival of Souls. And these figures, including Herc, come up out of the salt water and they form the, the, uh, the dance party, the eerie dance party that goes on in, on the dance floor at Salt Air. My parents went there every weekend, so I heard. So here, look how weird and eerie that was. And they got students from the University of Utah, their dance program. And they just came out, and they didn't even know what the movie was about. They just, he said, whirl around, you know, go here, go there. And uh, I don't know if the makeup is really that professional, but uh, somehow that makes it even better. Again, to me, you know, this is, and there's Herc again. And now 
This is the climax where they, they finally attack her, drive her from the, this is underneath Saldair where the water used to be. It's actually very well shot. And so then the next day, the cops come out to find out what happened to these people. See, this guy I love, that's uh, Aki Evans. He was the police chief in Salt Lake City. And they pulled him out and he did a great job. <laughs> and, and so, one last look at the Great Salt Lake, or the salt air. And then we're back to the original scene to have a resolution. They finally find the car and pull it up. And they look inside, and there are three girls, including Sandra. So was she dead this whole time? Was that just her spirit? Was it a ghost? And that's the end. <laughs> So when you, when you talk to people after you go home, say, oh yeah, we saw all about this movie called Carnival of Souls. And they'll say, what? <laughs> but I don't know, that's the, the wonderful thing about movies. You can also see some horrible examples of things about movies uh, that are cheaped out and everything. But this had the great locations it had a run and shoot style that documentary filmmaker like myself approved of. It was guerrilla film techniques. We're not gonna pay one cent for location <laughs> fees. And uh, it's, but it's produced in a pro professional way. You know, you, you can't look at it and say, oh, it looks like a home movie. The guy knew, they knew what they were doing. But it's the industrial filmmaker's dream to find a, a scripted film, to get the money to go make it, and then take your buddies and go out and you make it. And then nothing. He had to re wait uh, 15 years before it was released to television because he didn't own it. And it played in the Creature Double Feature uh, the 12 o'clock uh, movie slot. And the movie became extremely uh, famous and lucrative to him because it was shown in film festivals all over the world and on TV. And he finally got back in the revenue stream. And I saw an interview with him and he said, none of that matters. I'm a filmmaker. I've been a filmmaker for 30 years. And nobody can tell me I'm not a filmmaker because I make films. They can look down on the type of films I do, but I make films and I made a feature that played on television and played in drive-in movies. And uh, that, he said, made my career. And so uh, I think as a filmmaker, it inspires me. I think as a viewer, it should inspire you. Dig a little bit, <laughs> you know, go into the trash heap and uh, you might find something like a Paris, Texas or a Carnival of Souls. And so I have a screenplay for a movie about Herc Harvey making Carnival of Souls. <laughs> and if any of you have $2.5 million that you want to invest, <laughs> you can come see me after. <laughs>